Oi, como vão? Agora nós vamos começar a sessão de tumor board, que é a discussão de casos clínicos, casos reais de descalonamento. É um prazer ter aqui é, essas pessoas ilustres que tanto trabalham em benefício das mulheres e também em termos de descalonamento. Apresentando a mesa, Dr. Charles Padua, oncologista clínico da rede Cetos Mira de Saúde, em Belo Horizonte. Dr. Marcos Castilho, radio-oncologista é, da rede Oncoclínicas e um corajoso em descolanamento. É, doutora Nisha Sharma, é, radiologista-chefe do programa de rastreamento é, da, de Leeds e é, uma das investigadoras principais do Small Trial, Dr. Hitzman, radiologista da Universidade de Habnuk, em Amsterdã e na Holanda, que tem inúmeros trials em descalonamento percutâneo, o mais importante deles, o Minivab, que estuda a possibilidade de tratamento percutâneo com biópsia a vácuo. É, Dr. Stuart McIntosh, que é professor titular da King's University, em Belfast, e responsável principal pelo Small Trial, Dr. Rafael Branch, pesquisador, médico oncologista da rede Oncoclínicas de Saúde e do primeiro Cancer Center aqui em Belo Horizonte, da rede Oncoclínicas, aqui em conjunto com Dana Faber. Do, o doutor Alastair McIntosh é, deve entrar em algum momento. Já, já entrou o doutor Alastair McIntosh, que todos conhecem, teve recentemente no Brasil. É, da Universidade em Houston, da Duke University, e investigador principal do Comet, além de outros trials, inclusive um trial especial de descalonamento da radioterapia. Vamos começar com a discussão de casos e vamos, primeiro de tudo, que eu acho que é mais importante, é saber como é que estão as escolhas do passado. Então, a gente apresentou um caso ano passado, em 2022, discutimos e vamos revê-lo e atualizá-lo uma paciente de 56 anos, submetida ao rastreamento, promes de menopausa, sem história de reposição hormonal, portadora de lúpus sistêmico. Ela estava controlada e sem atividade. Isso durante a pandemia. Em... Ela começou com essa história em setembro de 2020, que foi quando estavam subindo os casos no Brasil, começou a nossa subida, a primeira onda. Really started this first wave. Mammograms had a morphed, amorphous group calcifications in the anterior third of the lateral superior quadrant of the right bra breast, seven millimeters, 120 millimeters from the nipple. Uh, uh, whereas for this was the mammogram that was discussed at the time. And uh, I think there's no doubt about the standard workup. I think just a, 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 a brief comment in the opinion of the radiologists. If there is any argument or any preference for not doing percutaneous biopsy, but rather open biopsy, the argument that we usually hear if, is that if I do an open surgery, I already have treated uh, uh, with margins. But my question is, what have you treated? What did you treat if you don't have a diagnosis? Nisha, Ritzi, what would be the workup indicated for this case? And how does it uh, work where you, uh, with you? And uh, thank you. Um, in the UK, um, we would um, do ultrasound to make sure that the lesion wasn't visible on ultrasound. And if not visible on ultrasound, we would then do an X-ray guided vacuum biopsy to obtain a diagnosis. Because as you said, in the UK, we, what we have are a cluster of calcifications, but no actual diagnosis as to what we're dealing with. So in, in our unit, we would perform... Um, a diagnostic vacuum-assisted biopsy to obtain a diagnosis. 
Yeah, we would do exactly the same. Dr. Heaty? Yeah, as I said, we would do exactly the same. So I don't have a lot to add. Um, I guess that I might do the ultrasound, but mostly to explain the woman that I'm going to do a stereotactic biopsy because the chances of finding these calcifications with ultrasound are, in my opinion, next to nothing. And we would place a marker there to show that we actually mm -hmm. biopsy the right spot and could, could go back eventually. Um, and other than that, I think roughly three quarters of calcifications that look like this are not malignant, right? So a surgical biopsy would be overkill in three quarters of your patients. Muito bom. É, o Dr. Rizzi coloca de que um lado a cirurgia diagnóstica... Dr. Rizzi says that on one side a diagnostic surgery would be a, a treatment that might be de-escalated for this patient to, to the biopsy. Do surgeons agree with that? Do they still believe that there is a group of calcifications that do require immediate surgery or not? Dr. Schuert? So, no, if you sent this patient to me from radiology with, uh, uh, with, with that mammogram and asked me to do an open biopsy, I would send them straight back to the radiologists and ask them to biopsy it because I wouldn't be operating um, on this patient without a diagnosis. As you say, it's possible that this is a patient, Ritz has said, it's a strong chance that they might be benign, in which case they don't actually need an operation. They can be managed percutaneously. And there is a possibility, given what we had about DCI, low risk DCIS earlier, that you could consider um, managing by active surveillance if this is truly low risk DCIS proven on VAB. And in the unlikely event that it is actually invasive disease, you would want to know so that you could carry out a definitive procedure at the first operation. So I, I don't think there's any role for an open biopsy here. Okay. Dr. Arlister? So? You're muted. You're muted, Alistair. Dr. Alistair, please. Good. So thank you so much and for being so patient with me to unmute, first of all, and secondly, to um, allow me to join you somewhat belatedly from doing my day job in the operating room. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. This is where the working together between imaging, surgery, pathology is something that has happened over the years. And just as the breast MIT conference is demonstrating how effective minimally invasive technology can be, I think this is a fine demonstration that not operating is the right thing. Thank you. Muito obrigado a todos. Well, thank you, all of you. Well, let's go on. So the patient did a vacuum assisted biopsy, according to the opinion of the consensus. So, so really, 24 samples with a 10 gauge needle. You can see that calcifications. Well, what we really did was to excise the lesions. So. It was an in situ carcinoma of intermediate grade, measuring three millimeters in the largest diameter. And the immunochemistry was ER positive, PER2 negative, AI67. At this case, at this moment, we decided to de escalate surgery and radiotherapy and to start with an astrozole, hormone therapy for five years, and active surveillance because this was during the pandemic. And now, three years later, you can see there is no sign of recurrence in both breasts and, uh, and the patient is doing well. So the first question then, which I'd like to ask you, initially, starting with Dr. Alastair, just so that we finish the, the update on this case, this is the typical low risk uh, DCIS that we find. Is this what we find that is recruited in the COMET trial? She could have been recruited into the COMET trial. You're absolutely right. The differences internationally between the active monitoring trials are subtle, but in the United States, we did allow grade two or intermediate grade patients when there were many other low risk features. Uh, and no high-risk creatures. 
So I'm delighted to hear that despite the pandemic um, or because of the pandemic, she was treated with active monitoring with anastrozole. And so far, she's done extraordinarily well. Congratulations. Vamos ver até quando, né, Dr. Rassé? A gente espera que tudo dê certo. Let's see up to when. Uh, she had a, an increased risk because of lupus and things like that, LES, but certainly we believe that, uh, just like you said, in, in Brazil, during the Brazilian conference, this is a possibility that can be offered for the future. Oncologists, I'd like to hear from you, Rafael and Charles, this patient, if this patient because uh, if you see this patient initially, particularly in our uh, supplementary service, uh, she will, you will uh, you will prescribe an astrozole. So you will need uh, she will need your prescriptions. Will you prescribe, or will you return the patient to do radiotherapy? Would you be comfortable in prescribing an astrozole for this patient? First of all, my colleague, Rafael, I want to hear his opinion. After all, I know the case very well. Thank you. Well, good afternoon or good evening. I'm not sure that the time zones, uh, what they are, but uh, this is always a multidisciplinary debate, isn't it, Enrique? We have to understand the image. We have to understand how easy or difficult it is to monitor a patient like this in terms of imaging and to, so that we can really do active monitoring adequately. And uh, we also need to think of the patients, the patient's wish. So I don't have a recipe, a ready-made recipe for this. I think it's... Uh, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. It's an interdisciplinary debate so that we can understand what's going on. And you have to talk with the, with the radiologists and to see what you expect might happen and how easy or difficult it is to identify changes that might suggest a worsening of the case so that uh, then we can decide what we want to do. So anyway, if a patient, a patient arise with this diagnosis of something similar, whether automatically she'll get a prescription. No, first of all, there is a multidisciplinary debate before we make a decision like that. Uh, Charles, this is not your patient, by the way, just reminding you that maybe you've got the wrong case. <laughs> yeah, I see many just like this. This is from last year, but you didn't see her. All right, then. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, Rick, in fact, it's very similar to so many that we have. And uh, you asked, does it, do you refer to surgery? As an oncologist, I am quite comfortable in debating, like Rafael said, in discussing all of the cases and to prescribe prophylaxis like we did. This patient is a young person, 56 years of age, and uh, using an astrozole and certainly use tamoxifen, like you said. It's whether the, the matter is that the patient has uh, lupus. And this is always a point where we have to avoid the thromboembolism. In this case, I think uh, uh, de escalating would be interesting here, depending on how well monitored the patient is. And certainly, I wouldn't refer to surgery at this point. Well, then I ask another question here because I think this is an important point because this was raised last year as well. We have two paths to follow, both in follow-up and in the decision of uh, therapy. Often, there is the debates of MRI for this patient. You see that in theory, this patient has a possible risk and uh, this breast. Would you to MRI before uh, deciding what to do with the patients or in monitoring the, pa the patients. Ritsi and Nisha, please. Um, I'll start. Um, I find this quite difficult in the sense that 
inside of a trial like Comet, Lord, Loretta, I would really argue against making an MR, right? Because what you argue there is that what we have here is a screen detected anom anomaly that is actually benign in origin, right? This is really not cancer. Um, our general appreciation of low grade ECS is currently still that it is a form of pre invasive disease that will progress eventually into cancer. So we treat cancer in that sense. The MR here will tell you whether the lesion is much more extensive or not, because it will be hard to see from this mammogram. It's actually quite difficult to interpret. And I can imagine that in a therapeutic setting outside of a trial, you would do the MR just to figure out whether there's in a, whether you really took out the lesion with the vacuum excision. Um, it, within the trial, no way, because that is the whole argument of the trial, and you might only see more that you do not honestly want to see. Um, there is in the therapeutic realm one more option, I guess, than what you just said so far, because in the law trial, these patients don't even get an astrovals, um, because we actually appreciate this as them an incidental finding. They are not treated at all. Um, I'm not sure whether that's safe. That's what Lord will tell us compared to what Comet will tell us, right? But we'll have to wait 10 years for that. Um, for this diagnostic setting where this is the curative approach for a patient outside of a trial, I think doing an MR is actually not a very bad idea. Um, in the UK, we, we wouldn't offer an, an MRI because what, what we have is um, low volume intermediate grade DCIS. So, um, and it presented as a focal cluster of calcifications, which have been excised with the extended vacuum assisted biopsy. So because it's low volume disease, um, it's not really going to affect the patient in terms of mortality and outcomes. So from our perspective, we would just do follow up mammograms as we would do for all our cases for five years, annual mammographic surveillance. But Nisha, you would in England on the normal circumstances do operation on this patient, right? Yes. So, I mean, in, in this case, we would have done a biopsy and it would have been a, a wide local excision. If on the biopsy we diagnosed intermediate grade DCIS, we would have done a wide local excision. But even with the diagnosis of intermediate grade DCIS in a focal cluster of calcifications, we wouldn't consider doing um, MRI to assess uh, multiplicality. Yeah, would you be willing to accept on a negative MR that there's no more additional disease and then um, just skip the operation? I mean, apart from the trials, but we skip the operations anyway, right? This is sort of the next step then. Yes. I, I mean, I think I think we've got to be careful what we're trying to achieve. And MR can be a value, but it can also be disadvantageous in the sense that it might highlight non-cancerous lesions as well, which then require second look ultrasound biopsy and follow-up. So from, from my perspective, where it's quite pragmatic that we've done a biopsy, we've got low volume intermediate grade DCIS and, um, and we treat it now in this situation, instead of surgery, the patient's had an extended vacuum biopsy because they've had quite a significant biopsy and it was a focal cluster. So we wouldn't offer MRI and um, we would just do annual mammographic surveillance. Okay, so also outside of the trial, we would agree that this is an alternative for surgery. That would then be the argument, right? That's also why I'm a little bit reluctant still. But I do agree that if this is an alternative for surgery, we would also not offer the MR. Yes. I'm only not entirely sure whether we can in this setting call this an alternative for surgery. But maybe yes. also yeah, I mean, I think from, from our perspective, the initial biopsy has been performed as an extended vacuum assisted biopsy because your initial intention was to remove the calcifications. And I suppose in in our um in the UK, our initial attention would be just to intention would be to get a diagnosis. So we wouldn't aim to remove the calcifications, but just to take um several samples to obtain a diagnosis and then do surgery to treat. So this, um, because it's very difficult with calcifications to know whether they're benign or malignant. So our intention would always be to have a diagnosis and then surgery. But even if the, the biopsy came back with low volume intermediate grade DCIS, 
we would proceed to surgery. Or in this case, because you've removed the calcifications, I'd be happy to move to surveillance without the need for further um, imaging with MR. I think I got the question right because the intention was to generate debate. So I think I got the, a good question for debate. But anyway, Marcus, the, is this patient, do you admit radiotherapy? Oh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Well, thank you for the invitation to take part of, of the event. This is a rather special patient, isn't it? My trend would be not to admit radiotherapy. This is a patient that did not have uh, uh, margins or amplifying margins, so I do radiotherapy. I think that during the pan it was during the pandemic when the excision was done. I also understand that adjuvants, radiotherapy is, is adjuvant therapy, and there's, it always runs at risk of being over treatment. So I also respect that uh, of not doing radiotherapy. And if the mastologist is doing okay by not amplifying the margins, not doing radiotherapy, you would do that. But I would, I mean, radiotherapy is a bit controversial after you do amplification of the margins. But if they have been amplified, I would be more at ease if not doing radiotherapy. But the fact that it's low volume disease and low grade, then you feel a bit more comfortable with that because the patient and the team decide not to do radiotherapy, the patient can be recovered from the surgical point of view if, if there is a recurrence. So it's a case to discuss. But I think that nowadays, with what we have of knowledge to omit uh, increasing the margins, and uh, we know this has to do with the recurrence, uh, uh, it reduces the risk of recurrence if we increase the margins. I think this starts right at the old, uh, the criteria right now. It's not amplifying or increasing the margins and not doing radiotherapy. You can do that, but I respect this because you have adjuvant therapy where often we will treat a lot of people to benefit very few. Well, it's done now. She gets there to your office and asks to radiate. She will not get a radiation now after a year and a half of monitoring? Certainly not. She already has mammograms without microcalcification of no residual disease or recurrence. It's now it's just time just to monitor. As a pathologist, if I ask you to, to do the following, if what Dr. Alastair has provoked with his studies is that the pathologist will have to report as follows in pseudocarcinoma, low risk versus high risk of progression. That's a change in how you have to report your, your findings in pathology. What do you think of that? Can you define that? Do you think you can define that to help in this definition, but just based on pathology and here's the pathology? That's really what matters, isn't it? From the clinical, from the medical standpoint, if it's if it has a low risk of progressing or high risk of progressing to invasive carcinoma. Can you hear me, Rodrigo? Are you muted? I'm sure you're muted. It's muted. You you. Right. Can you hear me now? Good. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me, Enrique. Well, the limit between a benign lesion and a typical lesion and a DCIS of low grade is the size of the lesion. The, if over two centimeters with the same morphological pattern, then they will be classified as a, as a DCIFs. So the, uh, calculating like this in pathology, sometimes I, I get a bit annoyed with this because it's a matter of including into a sample 
or end up going deeper or not to increase the, the lesion, the margins. Well, about the difference, it can be done quite simply. All you need is to have six atypical cells, three to six atypical cells. That's what matters. The volume doesn't matter that much. And I think that uh, Belo Horizonte and in Brazil, pathologists are capable and to make this distinction. So it's a technique that's here to stay. And pathologists need to adapt to this, I think. I don't see any problem with that. Well, thank you, Rodrigo. Let's go about, let's go now to case two. This patient, 68 years, postmenopausal, doing hormone replacement therapy, who had undergone eumectomy five years ago for lung cancer during the pandemic. That was 21 May, 2021. And at this moment, the patient is healthy. The two mammoplasties, last of which was 10 years ago. So a mam a mammogram and mammography and ultrasound found a node of uh, uh, category three, virus three. And cytology showed it to be a fibroadenoma. This was 21 May, 2021. Then she came over to us. We looked at the case. We disagreed with the finding. We repeated the, the tests. We found that the node was category four, was Virads four. And this is what it looked like. We thought it was a, a class Virads four, although there was cytology beforehand, uh, uh, FNAB showing it to be an adenoma and was stable in the last four or five months. So, Nisha and Risi, do you agree with me that it is discordance that maybe this needs to be further investigated? Or do you think that the cytology was okay? No, I mean, I, I would agree with you, Enrique. For me, this is definitely a BIRADS4. The, the problem with performing fine needle aspiration is that you will get under sampling and, and you're only achieving cells. So therefore, the diagnosis of a fibroadenoma or benign lesion, given the appearances on mammography and ultrasound, I would call that discordant. And I would definitely want to obtain further tissue with an ultrasound guided core biopsy. Yeah, so would I. I. I guess that just FNA is definitely insufficient for this funny thing. Um, however, if you have a core biopsy with a needle through this lesion on an image, um, and that comes back as a, as a fibroadenoma, I would buy it. Right? Okay. <laughs> Could be. Faz sentido. Acho que se fosse uma core biopsy, a gente talvez teria comprado. It makes sense. If it were a core, core biopsy, we would, have, we would have bought it. But uh, this is a diagnosis. And it was not. We went to the vacuum assisted biopsy, 24 core samples, a 10G needle, and we did the shaving of the cavity. And uh, the uh, result was uh, this uh, lesion here, Rodrigo, which uh, you can describe. It was an invasive carcinoma, right? Uh, a low-grade invasive carcinoma. Do you agree with this, Rodrigo? Is that all right? Yes, I agree. And uh, I will defend the uh, pathologist or the cytologist, as a matter of fact, that gave the uh, report because... Uh, as uh, the colleague said, maybe the uh, uh, aspiration function did not reach the, the, the main lesion, did not involve the main lesion. So uh, I agree that with, uh, or, or rather when there is a disagreement between the uh, cytopathology and the histopathology and the image, the uh, 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 workup has to continue, okay. right? Right, we then continued. Then, as we said, we removed the uh, carcinoma the, uh, uh, completely. It measured four millimeters in the pathology. The uh, shaving of the cavity came, came back negative. 
with immunohistochemistry, chemistry, ER, PR, 100%, HER2 negative. And this is just an example. And the sequence you submitted the patient to a, a lumpectomy, no tumor, no residual tumor. Uh, this is one of the cases which is in our next publication. And then we went to anastrozole, one gram per day for five years. So we de-escalated the uh, surgery and de-escalated uh, the uh, sentinel node and de-escalated radiotherapy. Because the patient had a breast cancer, uh, it was right next to the site where she did a pneumectomy. Alive, without symptoms, with a, a uh, mammography without changes. So we de-escalated radiotherapy and sentinel node biopsy during the pandemic before the sound. I wanted the opinion of the surgeons and of our oncologists. We'll start with uh, Stuart and Alistair. Would you de-escalate the uh, sentinel? Now, would you feel comfortable with this? 66 years, pneumectomy, avoid a general anesthesia. So I would certainly feel comfortable with that now, having seen the results of the, the sound trial. I might perhaps have felt a little less comfortable in 2021 doing it outside the setting of a clinical trial. Um, but I think actually under the circumstances that you've described, it's a, it's a very reasonable approach um, and I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. I would also be comfortable with the approach of uh, emitting radiotherapy in this patient very much in keeping with the low risk criteria described in the PRIME2 trial. So I think I think what's been done is, 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 is very reasonable indeed. Um, I would just caveat that with both before dis, uh, emitting sentinel node biopsy and emitting radiotherapy, it would of course be something to discuss with the patient because certainly in the UK, our national guidelines recommend the discussion of the emission of radiotherapy bearing in, in mind the, the slight increased risk of local recurrence that we saw in PRIME2. Um, but, but if the patient is comfortable, then yes. Dr. Alistair? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I'm afraid I agree with everything that Dr. Stuart McIntosh has just that's, said. This is terrible for our debate. Thing. What are we going to do? <laughs> and bearing in mind that I live and work in, in Houston in, in the United States, I think you have treated this woman exceptionally well in Brazil with uh, with the pandemic or not the pandemic. I think you are forward looking. We will probably be using the way you have treated this lady as our standard of care in two, three, four, five years time uh, across the world. But right now, you are cutting edge. So with the horrible sense that I am agreeing with Dr. Stuart McIntosh entirely here and the wonderful sense that this lady has been treated brilliantly in Brazil, I will say nothing more. Obrigado, Dr. Alistair. O nosso Obrigado. Dia agradece. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Alistair. We thank you very much. And the person responsible for omitting radiotherapy with a breast cancer is right here, Dr. Marco Castillo. I think uh, it is important to, when we discuss de-escalation is that you have to combine the entire team has to be in sync. The biopsies are uh, written wrongly there. It's biopsy. But anyhow, anyhow, Marcos is uh, the one who decided to omit radiotherapy because of her uh, uh, lung cancer on the right side. Marcos, she's doing really well, all right? I feel good about it. And I agree with the two colleagues, Stuart and Alastair. I think that uh, the most controversial here would be to do or not a, a sentinel lymph node about de-escalating radiotherapy. We use it very little and we should use it more in a patient that is fully inside the criteria of a prime two and uh, the call GB. So a patient that it is a very small tumor, low grade tumor, and I, I am uh, really is safe and not irradiating uh, back then it was also the beginning of the uh, uh, five-fraction radiotherapy for the whole breast. So maybe in our group, we already did 
uh, partial breast uh, radiotherapy. Maybe we would do it at that time, uh, even at the beginning of the use of uh, radiotherapy, a uh, whole breast radiotherapy in five fractions. We would do it partial uh, bed, but for this patient, it fits perfectly within the criteria, and I think it is totally uh, total totally doable to de-escalate with the patient's awareness and agreement. That's what we did. Four millimeters, invasive, 66 years, 25% of KM67. If the patient comes to you, Raphael or Charles, it didn't come to you, but if it did, if the patient came to you, would the, uh, the, and then this patient comes back because you want to know information about lymph node or about the uh, sentinel node or not, well, I'll, I'll let Charles answer that now. Now it is my turn, right? We are just pushing the problem to one another here, right? Well, first, yes, but uh, uh, a, a very well uh, done case with uh, four millimeters, we, uh, we will not need the lymph node there. This is a postmenopausal patient that has a strongly positive hormonal receptors. I would not think about doing any uh, treatment with chemotherapy for this patient uh, uh, within this context. Even if it comes, let's imagine here, if we were to, uh, to if we were presented one positive node, I would not do that approach. I would give her an astrozole. Now, uh, Raphael. I agree. I agree with all the uh, colleagues here. I think that from the viewpoint of oncology, the thing that most concerns me is not the uh, lack of the sentinel node, but how this, as this patient was submitted to a vacuum biopsy, the surgery did not produce residual lesion, then it is difficult to uh, de facto establish the size of the lesion. So here it is a discussion for Rodrigo to uh, uh, give a certainty that I am facing a four millimeter tumor, tumor that after that a uh, four millimeter tumor, regardless of uh, immunohistochemical uh, characteristics, it is a tumor of very low risk, a very small tumor, what concerns me in these cases to be sure that I'm talking about a tumor of four millimeter. So a four millimeter tumor is solved here with an astrozole from the viewpoint of a systemic tumor. If there's a larger, if it is a larger tumor, we are concerned with the KM6725, then we would require more information. But being fully aware that we are facing here a T1A tumor, this patient is really well cared for. Now we'll start to make things a bit more confusing. And uh, let's start it. Uh, a new case is 74 year old patient, engineer, a widow, two sons and a daughter, having uh, a grouped classifications, amorphous on the right breast, peripheral to a distortion, architectural distortion related to previous surgery for breast cancer, invasive breast cancer. Five years ago, she has about six months. Uh, it's been six months that she interrupted her uh, hormonal therapy. Uh, no findings in the uh, U ultrasound and physical examination without any, ab any abnormality. Five years of treatment of a PT1B, uh, N0, M0, menopause at 45 years of age. And this was the uh, lesion. As you can see, uh, a very amorphous calcifications, very thin. Uh, Nisha and uh, Ritzi, biopsy for uh, her. And what do you think about the uh, clinician or the person who is assessing this mammogram without a high quality monitor, a five megabyte uh, monitor? What do you think? Um Again, I mean, I with these calcifications, I would still do ultrasound because that's part of our assessment and workup. But I would go on to do a stereo vacuum assisted biopsy. These calcifications are extremely fine, and um, you do need to use a five megapixel monitor when looking for calcifications, particularly when they're this subtle, as they may be overlooked in a lower resolution monitor. Um, Your thoughts, Ritzy? 
Yeah, you basically said it all. Honestly, on these few screenshots here, I would almost be willing to call this sort of dystrophic calcifications in the setting of post-therapeutic breast, right? Um, I guess you need a real monitor to see whether there are um, there are calcifications that are suspicious enough to do the stereotactic biopsy. I think I would skip the ultrasound here, especially in a post-therapeutic breast. I don't really think that I will ever find anything. But what I tend to say to um, other physicians and actually also to my residents is push your seat back. And then if you sit in this distance from the screen and you still see the calcifications, they are irrelevant, right? Um, if you have a computer screen um, and then downgraded image there, and you you cannot you can see the calcifications. That means that we likely see many many more. Um, and if you don't see anything, walk down to the radiology department to actually have a look at the real monitor because it makes a hell of a difference. Ok, acho que basicamente é isso. No Brasil, poucos têm acesso a um monitor. Normalmente, in Brazil, a... very few have access to such a monitor. Usually, the clinicians see the mammogram in a film, and uh, we criticize the indication of a biopsy by the radiologist. But this has to be very clear. The uh, clinician in the film is not seeing what the radiologist is seeing. So this is something that is very different that must be taken into account. So we biopsied the calcifications with a stereotaxy. And what we did were 24 core samples of 10G needle, 5 grams uh, DCIS, high grade DCIS of 2 millimeters. That was suspected of microinvasion. However, immunohistochemistry uh, ruled out invasion and confirmed DCIS, high grade DCIS, a negative hormonal receptor. A different from the invasive carcinoma she had, which was positive for hormonal receptor, her positive with KI67 of 25%. And uh, and then we have the question. Uh, as to what Dr. Alistair said in his studies, uh, uh, re rescue mastectomy, uh, nipple sparing, the breast has been radiated. Uh, nipple sparing, mastectomy, uh, lumpectomy, new uh, sentinel node biopsy, or in the case of mastectomy, or in case of lumpectomy. Rodrigo confirming two millimeters of uh, high grade DCIS, marginal to a, a, scar, a scarring tissue of previous treatment five years ago. As I said before, a, a, a high-grade DCIS, the uh, size matters very little for the uh, diagnosis. Uh, all you need is a minimal number of cells with important atypia that it will be even below two millimeters. It will be classified as a high-grade DCIS. Another interesting thing, the uh, negative receptors, right? And uh, hair uh, three crosses. So this really uh, seals the diagnosis of a high-grade DCIS. So we can say that it is a, a high-risk high risk lesion for progression. The question I ask for the surgeons now, uh, who will decide on the uh, treatment sequence? Yeah, is it a treatment failure? Is is it a rela relapse? Because it is a marginal lesion that is marginal to the previous uh, conservative treatment. Dr. Alistair talked about being a new clone or a different clone. Mm. So, so this is DCIS occurring in the same breast. So it is probably four times out of five derived from the original clones. There's a big difference between the DCIS that comes back as DCIS or even as invasive disease versus originally primary invasive disease returning as a second invasive disease. However, whatever is happening at the molecular level, the questions that you've posed, what surgery should be done next, are very good ones. And I think I would sit down with the patient. I would assess what is the shape, what is the size of her breast, are the signs of radiation changes as a consequence of her prior surgery? 
and outline to her the options of potentially repeat breast conservation, potentially backing that up with some form of either uh, localized or perhaps less often whole breast radiation in this situation. I would suggest to her that a, a mastectomy, even a nipple sparing mastectomy might be possible. But I think it needs a long conversation with the, the patient and the surgeon, and perhaps most useful of all to involve radiation oncology, who will have very wise opinions to offer. Stuart, uh, veja bem. Stuart, you see that uh, it were 24. We had 24 core frag uh, samples, 10 grams, uh, 5 grams, uh, and uh, Nisha Stewart and, and uh, hit uh, a, a two millimeter uh, high grade DCIS. This is a highly uh, conspicuous, highly very small uh, lesion. Do you think that there's more disease there? What is the likelihood of having more disease there? And if you would uh, order an MRI before making this treatment decision? Eu falei que eu ia tumultuar. I said I was going to mess things up a little bit, didn't I? It goes in all directions, right? My first question would be whether the DCS that's found has anything to do with the microcalcifications, right? These are definitely far further apart than two millimeters. So if there's only this two millimeter fo focus of DCIS, then I would be definitely questioning the correlation between the DCS and the calcifications, um, which means that it is an accidental finding that we have actually no clue how big it is. Yeah. Nisha, a chance de ter sido Nisha, the yeah, likelihood I mean, of uh, having been completely resected. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Ritzi. Um, that when you look at the images, it's very difficult to size what we're looking at. And again, with the histology, what we have is small volume high grade DCIS. But the question is, is it calcified or non calcified DCIS? And, and you have taken a large amount of tissue um, with only a focal area of high-grade DCIS, but in a woman that's had previous surgery um, without an, an obvious mammographic abnormality, I would have some concerns about sizing um, and probably would consider um, additional imaging just to make sure that we're not dealing with a larger lesion. May I ask a question? The uh, pathologist there, did he report the microcalcification? Okay. Okay. Yes, determinant. They were determinant. Stuart. So I'm pleased to hear Nisha say that she considered it difficult to size the lesion. I thought it was my poor quality computer monitor and my surgical eyesight that were the problem, but I found it very difficult to size that lesion as well. So I think in our MDT, we probably would discuss the requirement for further imaging. I think we would also want, as Alistair has said, to discuss, this is terrible, I'm agreeing with him again, to discuss the role of re-irradiation in this setting. I agree, I think, the, the evidence is, is, is quite scanty in this situation. I would certainly be thinking about the possibility of recon, uh, reconserving this patient. I don't think she's necessarily mandated to have a mistake to me just because she's had previous breast conserving surgery and, and radiation therapy. Um, it's difficult without examining the patient to consider what your oncoplastic options for, you know, um, repeat conservation and remodeling of the breast might be, whether this is someone who's suitable for a, a therapeutic mammoplasty type of operation, whether if it's in the upper outer quadrant, you might consider volume replacement with a perforated flap. I don't, I don't know. These are all things that you could consider. But as Alistair says, I think first and foremost, I want to discuss with the MDT underscoring the fact that this is a multidisciplinary, you know, undertaking about the role of repeat radiotherapy and then it will be a conversation with the patient about the slightly increased risk of secondary local recurrence that we see following repeat conservation in this setting. Ela tem 74 anos. 
She is 74 years old. So we are discussing here a procedure, a mastectomy uh, with immediate reconstruction, a large uh, procedure in a 74-year-old patient versus a, a reconservation. We divided this uh, decision. We shared this decision with the patient. We chose to reconser for reconservation and new radiotherapy first. <clears throat> Although, as Stuart said, it is a challenge, this uh, new cosmetic uh, result. So I brought here, this is not our uh, current cosmetic result, what we expected, but this is an issue to be discussed when you talk about a new treatment, new conservative treatment. A new conservative treatment doesn't necessarily mean that it will bring the best cosmetic result because you already have a defect on the breast and you have previous radiotherapy. But the patient's option would be a flap because of a previous radiotherapy, a, a flap from uh, the back uh, with a prosthesis, which might not yield a very good result as well. So I would like later, not right now, I'd like Dr. Alistair to talk about this. In your study, that this is a secondary issue to, to consider this. What is the cosmetic advantage of a, a reconservation? This is something to be considered as well. We submitted this patient to a, a lumpectomy and the result, of course, the lack of residual lesion. There was nothing else there. And this was her result 21 days after surgery. Well, uh, having no residual lesion and serocarcinoma without hormonal receptor. Marcos, radiotherapy. Uh, yes, uh, radiation therapy reduces the risk of uh, relapse. Uh, we have very little data in the literature, but uh, they are consistent about this. However, a patient, although the tumor is a high-grade tumor, it is a high-grade in situ tumor. If we consider that the margin was uh, broadly uh, resected in an elderly patient, with a possible use of hormone therapy, and then it depends on this issue, I would tend not to irradiate. So uh, maybe if this patient had not done previous radiotherapy, she would fit somehow a, a such a small tumor, she would fit a criteria of not doing ra uh, radiation therapy anymore. If we choose for radiation therapy, it would be a, a radiation therapy on the bed, only not on the entire breast, a partial uh, breast uh, radio radiation therapy. And if the team decided to redo radiation therapy, what we have more evidence today in the literature is of brachytherapy. So brachytherapy is an invasive treatment, very difficult to be done, and today it is easily replaced by external radiation therapy with a good control, with deep aspiration uh, uh, breath hold. I would do that for her, but I would use uh, a fraction of brachytherapy. I would discuss uh, uh, breast, I have discussed breast uh, re-radiation in a meeting recently. One of the arguments is that we didn't have experience to do five or 520 and on the tumor bed in a situation of re-irradiation, but what we have more evidence about is uh, do it with uh, 4800, which is a very high dose per fraction. So if you can replicate this brachytherapy as a partial breast radiotherapy, I had no problems in doing even a milder scheme than that of 4800. Five of 420 I would do in this case, but specifically in this case, I would not do adjuvant radiotherapy. And this case was not seen by you, but your, your team, uh, people in your team, and they decided not to radiate because the uh, radiotherapist decided on that later. And then we have the issue for the two oncologists here. Is it a relapse? Is it a new tumor? I come back with tamoxifen secondary uh, radiation therapy and Ciro has no hormonal receptor. I will not give her anything, but she was not irradiated. What's going to happen about, what, about the two of you? What do you think? Well, uh, <risos> Desculpa, Rafael, te atropelei. Não. 
Well, we thought about the same thing uh, from the systemic viewpoint. Nothing to do for this patient. The patient is treated. Yeah, I agree. Charles. Well, this is something that is uh, very curious. We're talking about a, 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 a breast recurrence that we're not giving anything to her. The surgery was done of reconservation, and we're not doing radiotherapy, we're not doing hormone therapy, we're doing nothing. But it is a, a, a relapse. Now, the last case, uh, case number four, uh, a provocative case, 46-year-old lawyer married without children, came to the clinic for the first time in January 2019 for breast checkup before uh, a mammoplasty after bariatric uh, surgery. She had no history of ovarian or breast cancer and a mammoplasty at 17 years, 17 years before uh, mammograms, a US bid category one. She was discharged for a new mammoplasty and we scheduled her next screening. The same year she came back with a, a endometrial biopsy with a diagnosis of uh, endometrial cancer. I referred her to a gynecologic surgeon of our team and he treated her for the endometrial cancer. Then she came back for screening and she started to do uh, a seri seriated screening, uh, serious screening. We talked about her intermediate risk, what she wanted to do about her screening and she had an endometrial cancer, a past of a bariatric surgery, a heavy weight. Uh, she uh, had a number of factors and she decided to continue with uh, mammograms and then she went to screening with uh, tomosynthesis. Uh, June, 2023, uh, DBT, we found this uh, uh, node, speculated uh, node and we went to a vacuum-assisted biopsy, and in this uh, biopsy, we found a carcinoma, pleomorphic lobular carcinoma invasive of eight millimeters, grade three, high grade. So uh, sh the shaving of that cavity, the margins, we assessed the margins separately. There was no residual tumor. I would like to talk with Nisha and uh, uh, Ritzy, very quickly about the uh, procedure. If in the UK, uh, 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 VAB is being assessed uh, for, for this tumor, this is not a typical tumor or small, but you have uh, tried the capacity of resection in the mini VAB. What, how, what do you feel about uh, the capacity of being able to do a resection Percutaneous a vacuum resection of this type of lesion. What do you think? Well, we didn't mean if up this would be complete exclusion criteria due to the simple fact that we are looking at the lobular invasive breast cancer. Um, I must admit that the pleomorphic ones in general appear much more like ductal cancers. So in that sense, it should be sort of possible. Um, but entering a lobular cancer in such um, a study, I find a little bit tricky. Um, then again, what you did is great, right? You, you, you took the lesion out and you actually checked the margins. Um, that would be the sort of surgical approach. Um, considering it's lobular, I would definitely have made an MR in this case without also thinking twice, um, and preferably before taking out the entire cancer. <laughs> um, but other than that, um, yeah, I think you actually cured her. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I mean, this this wouldn't meet the criteria for small. And and if we had biopsied and she was upgraded to grade three, she would automatically go for surgery. I think um, we, we are lacking evidence with regards to particularly lobular cancer and grade three cancers um, about using minimally invasive techniques because with the small trial, you know, we, we're avoiding doing sentinel lymph node biopsy and we're doing vacuum excision of the cancer. But when you've got somebody who's got a grade three cancer and it's lobular, we know from from a, an auxiliary point of view that can be a bit more challenging. So um, I, I 
in the context of a trial, I think it would be fine. But out with a trial, I think we'd definitely be very nervous. And I'm sure our surgeons wouldn't accept excision with vacuum and would want to go for surgery in sentinel node. Rodrigo, a avaliação das margens da cavidade percutânea. Rodrigo, assessing the margins of the percutaneous cavity, what is what happens for the pathologist considering these samples? Well, well uh, lobular invasive carcinoma, can you show me the image? It seems that uh, I, I can't quite see details. Very good. But e e Kaderin, it seems to be positive, probably. With, with the, which is anomalous. The normal is to be ecadrine negative in this type of situation, but the behavior of this lesion being grade three should be, or oh, is similar to an, an invasive carcinoma, high grade carcinoma. So I'm not a surgeon or an oncologist, but I think that if it were in a, a, a relative of mine, mother or sister, I would like to have an excision, surgical excision, plus the sentinel uh, lymph node. That's the opinion of a pathologist, of course, which isn't that much. Well, what we did, we did the MRI. Uh, I, we did the MRI and uh, so he decided to do that. The, I, I knew he'd ask it, it came normal. And also genetic testing. There was an endometrial cancer before that. So, and we decided for a sentinel no biopsy. And uh, would you omit axillary staging Stuart or Alistair? Um, I don't think I would in this setting. I think we know that this is a higher grade, cancer grade three, it's a pleomorphic lobular. Um, I think there is a risk that this patient um, might well have nodal disease that's not picked up on her axillary ultrasound scan. We also point out that only a relatively small proportion of the patients in sound had lobular cancers. I think it was about uh, eight or nine percent. Um, if I remember correctly, so I wouldn't be happy omitting auxiliary staging in this in this setting. So I, I'm once again in agreement, but maybe I would add that the Society of Surgical Oncology in the setting of older women over 70, it, it's it's a little bit vague, but I practice their recommendations to omit central lymph node biopsy in, in women over the age of 70 who have small ER positive, usually screen detected cancers. I do not omit, and in fact, I've just come from operating on somebody having a lumpectomy in central lymph node biopsy for a small pleomorphic lobular cancer because they are such sneaky beasts. You just never know what they're going to do. So I'm in agreement. I would um, do a central lymph node biopsy in this patient. Thank you. Como eu lembrei de vocês, eu também não omiti. As I remembered, uh, remembering you, I did not omit it either. So I did the sentinel thinking of Dr. Stewart and Dr. Alistair. And uh, just like you see, there was no more residual tumor and the sentinel uh, came negative. So the question I asked to Charles and Marcus and Raphael, first of all, Charles and Raphael, if omitting a sentinel lymph node, you would ask the patient to return to stage the axilla. This patient, for me, it's essential to have some form of staging of the axilla. Like Rodrigo said, a high grade pleomorphic lobular tumor, it is like a ductal tumor, it's a higher risk tumor. I would not be comfortable in in not having the staging of the axilla. Here we talk 
talking of P1B with this cytology. But th this can be quite different if it sends zero and one. It changes our approach for systemic therapy. Yeah, I agree with with that. It's a, it's a patient relatively young. She had endometrial cancer at 44 years of age, I think, or quite 40 years of age, I'm sure. But maybe at menopause. But anyway, it's a patient, like Rafael said. I would not be comfortable without the information. I would want the information of whether she has some lymph node involved in it so that we can plan therapy. Marcus, what was the radiotherapy you did? The, the standard is 40 grays in 15 uh, fractions. I always talk with patients with some difficulty of going to the radiotherapy center about treatment in five fractions. And because the the prosthesis was not a con contraindication, although it was not represented well in the study. However, during the pandemic, for those who don't know, pandemic in Brazil, it was chaos, total chaos. Particularly the beginning of it was very chaotic. You know, doctors didn't know exactly what to do. It was soon after the, the tragedy in Italy. So people were really scared and we adopted five fractions we did this a little more broadly, and the results that we got for these patients with prosthesis and even with some patients with the radiation until drainage are results that suggest that five fractions is easier on the patients in terms of side effects compared to 40 uh, fractions. So I do offer this, guiding the patient, obviously, that uh, it's not yet the standard of care in the world, it is being studied in some countries, particularly in the United Kingdom, but if there is any difficulty or for people to go to the radiotherapy center, there's no problem with doing that in five fractions. I'm not too sure what was the treatment, but in a standard, it's still 14, 15, 40, 15 for patients with the prosthesis, if the patients can understand this, if not, yeah, uh, and particularly if the patient can go to the radiotherapy center without any problem. Yeah. Just to close the de debate, I'd like to point to one aspect. She was operated. We did oncoplasty for her. It was that worked well. Different from the original plasty, the aspect is much better now of the breast. And uh, however, what happened in the four cases, which I think is important for us to, to see and to bear in mind, all four patients underwent a percutaneous procedure that did the treatment and potential therapy. None of them had residual disease after surgery. All four, I, I just potentially, I'm not, I'm not saying that they were not, did, but they were they were potentially diagnosed at the moment of a biopsy, which requires oncological studies that need to be done with good planning because in countries like Brazil, where you take 11 months to start therapy or six months to get a biopsy, this can make a huge difference. I'd like to thank you all and uh, for this wonderful time that you spent with us. It's very thankful for you for being so generous with us for me, this was a very important debate. The cases are, are, are yeah, cases in which I participate in some way. You helped me and helped me also. I was thought of you, so it helped me out a lot throughout. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I could make a last comment here, a detail about the last case, a patient, 46 years, with a history of endometrial cancer and breast cancer, she has uh, or rather, it's important for this patient to be assessed by a geneticist. It's a patient for us to keep our eye on because the significant variants sometimes need to be reclassified. Some uh, patients with a high risk of a 
uh, Lean syndrome or something like that. So we need to have this in mind and to keep this on our radar. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, and thank you so much. Thank you.